À Paris, quand un amour fleurit, ça fait... Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Pablo Darellana, and welcome to the Café Mistral here in Paris. Um, you might hear children screaming. It's because the local school seems to have just broken off for the day. So, first of all, let me thank you for having made this term exceptional for me. It's my very first time teaching in War Studies Online. I was, I'm sure, like many of you, I wasn't too sure what to expect of an online master's, and particularly as a teacher that is used to doing this residentially. You know, I stand in, in front of a few hundred students in lecture halls. But I have to say, this has been an exceptional experience for me. In particular, I have to say, is you guys that made it amazing. You are some of the best students I've ever had, the most committed, and truly, you have worked yourselves to death on what is a very difficult um, module on philosophy, essentially, and how we apply philosophy to international relations to understand what is what, what are we looking at, that's, that's the role of theory. So, um, also, I'm happy to show myself to you for the very first time. Um, so, I've grouped your questions from the forum into three main ones. The first is Andrew's and many other people's questions about empiricism and positivism and what the relationship is between the two and what it means to move from positivism to post-positivism, like critical theorists, Marxists and others. Um, the second, shall we say, group of questions of interest to talk about today um, from Jake and Muna is non-Western perspectives, the post-colonial perspective, the global perspective. Um, and thirdly, Cassie brought up a question on the history of realism that I think is a good opportunity to talk about the history of IR theory and why debates like this happen and so on. So let me start again from the top. Andrew left us with a very difficult question. Is Positivism, the same as empiricism, i.e. is empiricism um, this, a scientific approach that requires positivism to, in order to create demonstrable claims and an analysis? Well, no, is the short answer. Um, positivism wants, as Andrew said in his forum entry, to ascertain absolute causality by testing hypotheses. And now ascertaining absolute causality here means that you have to make sure, as an analytical approach, that the contents of the data alone and the measurements and contrasts between numerical sets of data explain the effect. And that means that you need to achieve an explanation of what we call absolute causality. Causality being, of course, I slap noise happens. We can hypothesis test whether Pablo's slapping hands will make noise. Can we test whether Trump's point of view will change American politics? That's a lot more nuanced and subtle. And that's where we go to the first problem. For some positivists, not all, but some positivists, um, particularly in American political science rather than IR, are very keen to demonstrate that positivism is the only way we can make causal claims in political science. Now, post-positivists say that empirical study doesn't necessarily require statistics and particularly hypothesis testing in terms of absolute causality, achieving effective causality. Uh, now, in post-positivism, we try to also be empirical, but we try to appreciate the qualitative side of politics. Um, which is not possible to do in the same way as positivist studies. So in some way, post-positivism here, I'm trying to say, addresses questions that are perhaps a little bit too subtle for a positivist approach. Let me give you a very good example. Um, a typical traditional positivist approach that has reigned in uh, political science since the 1920s is, of course, opinion polling. Now, the problem with polling and treating polling like bacteria on a test tube is that the subjects of polling are humans, and just like yourselves, humans are a pain in the ass to investigate because they have opinions. They think. And right now, for instance, I have several ideas of myself as a teacher, as an individual, as the guy in front of the camera, but also as a European sitting in a coffee shop in Paris. Um, 
And so the problem with this is that this brings the problem of subjectivity. Subjectivity is a glorified theory word for, sub for perspective. The point of view, and the problem with the point of view is that the same empirical reality can mean different political things. Of course, the classical example that I've, I've brought up with several of you several times by now, when you've asked me about it in the Life Clinic, is the difference between a freedom fighter and a terrorist. The difference between a freedom fighter and a terrorist is not necessarily one that positivism can capture. Why? Well, factually speaking, both are using illegitimate means to overthrow the state for uh, something that they believe is a good purpose, yeah? Um, off liberation of someone or other. Now, Mandela was called a terrorist by the apartheid regime. We think of him as a liberator of South Africans. What is the empirical difference between a freedom fighter and a terrorist in the case of Mandela? A point of view. Which is why post positivist approaches try to understand that essence of politics. How do I make Mandela evil or liberator? And what are the politics in doing so? This can still be deeply empirical, of course. For instance, Mandela would have been described as a terrorist in writing, in speeches, right? That we can analyze. So empiricism, to go back to Andrew's original question, empiricism is still possible from a post-positivist perspective. For instance, we can investigate how certain identities are constructed. Mandela is a terrorist, Mandela is a freedom fighter. A much more obvious example is, of course, gender. Gendering is a construction of the feminine subjectivity into society, yeah? So let me ask you a silly question that I love to ask of my second year theory students here at King's. Um, why can't I wear a skirt? Is there an empirically physical reality that prohibits me from wearing a skirt? When I was doing research in North Africa in the desert, wearing loose uh, clothing down there was a tremendous advantage. So why can't I wear a skirt in a very warm London evening? Social norms. Yeah? Social norms. Gendering creates a man that wears trousers, except in Scotland, in formal occasions. Yeah? So that's where we go into the critical theories that try to appreciate how subjectivity is built to make politics happen. And furthermore, in the case of some critical theorists like constructivists and particularly post-structuralists, the Foucauldian type, are obsessed with understanding power. So a question that realists are obsessed with, right? But they understand power in a deeply empirical way. And this is, I think, one of the best demonstrations how, of how post-positivism can really address positivist questions. Power, for Foucauldian scholars, is an idea of legitimacy, for instance. I have the legitimacy to tell you these things because I'm your teacher, which has made me an agent of your education. And who has made me an agent? The institution, King's College London, has made me an agent of your education with intellectual power. And then furthermore, the law, tradition, ideas of academia, intellectuality have made King's College London the institution that can create agents that have the power to teach and mark your assessments, you see? So power is paradoxically the most empirical um, side of post-positivism and we have to look, we research power in terms of practices. So for instance, when a diplomat decides to do something, that can be an application of power. And we try to empiricize, I have an empirical understanding of what power is. So for instance, if you look at the paper I sent you last week, my own paper on diplomacy in Western Sahara, Algeria and Morocco, you'd be interested to know that there, the capacity to describe these guys are terrorists is a very real moment of power. Just like the moment that some apartheid propagandist propaganda guy had the genius idea, genius idea, to say the ANC and Mandela are terrorists. Why? Because this delegitimized the entire ANC, the cause of African liberation, away from this racist regime as an act of illegitimate terrorism. Incredible. 
Um, of course, that also went back. And that's why we need post-positivist qualitative approaches that can understand something as difficult and as complex as subjectivity. Why is this a nice cafe and not a nasty cafe? Subjectivity. Now, enough of the torture of post-positivism. Let's move to another very interesting question, and indeed my favorite. So thank you very much, Muna and Jake, for bringing it up. And that is delocalizing IR theory. So far, for the last four units, we have been banging on on Western-centric, European-centric, to be precise, perspectives on international relations. Well, on the, on the, as a lecturer, let me tell you that in, in terms of administration, sadly, because this is a very short module, um, we simply don't have the time, and we have only just had the time to compress all of the, shall we say, the basic canon of IR theory into this module. Had we had any more time, I would have brought, possibly for instance, if we had a second term, I would have brought the opposite, the critical approaches, the non-Western approaches to international relations theory. Um, now, the main approaches to, shall we say, post-Western IR, uh, post-colonial theory and decolonial theory. Now, post-colonial theory um, emerged by using critical approaches, so the subjectivity, yeah, savages or imperial subjects, kind of question, um, into um, studies initially of literatures. So you've got great figures like Edward Said that try to understand how do we construct the Oriental, the, so the Middle East and other, as inferior, as in need of judgment, as in need of discipline and governance, um, the, the frequent criticism that the West gives itself the right to tell the rest of the world what to do all the time, right? And, you know, we will make them democratic, even if it means dropping democracy from uh, uh, the Bay of a Bomber, in the case of the Iraq War. Um, now, postcolonial perspectives use critical approaches to try to understand how identity it becomes endowed with power, particularly Western identity becomes endowed with serious transnational symbolic power and normative power, the power to say France tells you what to do because France is right. Britain tells Afghanistan what to do because Britain knows better. But also the opposite, of course, the assumption that the Oriental subject in the case of Iraq, the Asian subject in the case of the Vietnam War, simply does not know better. Now, this is a major part of IR theory and has been for the last 30 years. I am myself a post-colonial scholar. Um, and to, it started post-colonial scholarship trying to understand uh, the leftovers of empire. Um, France and this very part of Paris is a very good example. I am right now in one of the most multicultural parts of Paris where the tensions of the post-empire, of the post-colony, are extremely visible. As I'm sure you've heard, French political debates are split between an approach that demands integration, that they drop any previous identity. Now, post-colonial scholarship has retrieved very quickly, back in the 80s in fact, that this is a direct leftover of empire. Integration and assimilation were official policies of the French Empire from the 1860s until the 1960s. Um, so that's a very obvious way in which subjectivity from empire remains. But in the post-colonial, there's more than that. That was a direct leftover. For instance, the relationship between Algeria and France today is a nightmare of a very peculiar post-colonial type where the Algerian still plays the role of the other in French politics, and the French still plays the role of the other in Algerian politics. Nightmare, of course, is that it makes them both quite regressive, and it means that it has helped FLN, the, the group that kicked out the French out of Algeria in the 1960s, remain in power until this day. Um, and at the same time, France has been in serious difficulties to overcome the ideational leftovers of that colonial experience. And, just to return to our earlier question of subjectivity, the debate is still, were, were the Algerian independence fighters terrorists? Criminals? Destroying French civilization and the gifts that France was leaving them? Or were they freedom fighters? So the post-colonial perspective, I have to say, is the one that I'm the sorriest not to be able to teach you guys. Um, it would probably be the subject of a much more focused um, module that tries to take these theories at the global level 
Um, and I think the post-colonial perspective is one that is very important for another reason. Many of you guys have started to touch upon the problem of do all theories explain all things? And the problem is that very often that's not the case. It's one of the major failures, shall we say, of realist and liberal theory that they are so universalist, everything is explained by the same dynamics, that that's not often the case. Problems as peculiar as French foreign policy in North Africa are mediated by these old ideas of empire, post-empire and identity that a subjectivity is much too specific to the historical experience that France and Algeria are locked in together to be able to generalize at the global level, right? Uh, Spivak, for instance, looked at, uh, and Homi Baba, as well as the experiences of the British Empire in India and the leftovers of these in the post-colonial mind. Uh, my own former doctoral supervisor, Vivian Jabri, wrote a spectacular book called The Post-Colonial Subject, where she takes this to, to late modernity, to now, to our time, and tries to retrieve how modern humanitarianism, global governance, even millennium development goals, all of these good intentions and good things and international efforts are still imbued with the assumptions of empire, the hierarchies of race, the hierarchies of who knows better, who is more developed. So temporality, for instance, you are backward, we are forward. Yeah, um, Spatiality, hot places make people go slow kind of assumptions. Ridiculous. Um, but they also help us understand much more specific items of politics. So for instance, in my upcoming book on the diplomacy of the first Vietnam War, that's the war before the Americans got involved, I study how the French dragged the Americans into that war. And I realized that one of the key factors in, in the French persuading the Americans that the Vietnamese were not independence fighters, but rather parts of a Stalinist conspiracy, was racism. The French made the overt argument that the Vietnamese, being an oriental tropical race, had been in the heat for too many thousand years, and therefore they use words like indolent, they use words like passive politically, they're uninterested, apathetic in politics because they've just been too warm for too long, you see? And therefore, if they were successfully fighting against French imperialism between 45 and 54, it was due to Soviet power and Soviet influence and Soviet direction. They would never have been able to do this on their own. And amazingly, as my book shows, it's coming out in February, if you're interested, um, it's called The Diplomatic Road to Vietnam by Ivy Torres. My book shows how this played a key role in persuading American diplomats that, yeah, this must be a Stalinist conspiracy. Even though American diplomats deeply sympathized with the Vietnamese claim of kicking the French out, imperialism no more. So post-colonial theory is something that I wish I could teach you. Um, I'm now going to talk you through a couple of readings that perhaps might be a very practical introduction. So a very good one, it's a very humble beginning, but a very powerful and persuasive one is a paper by Mark Laffey called Decolonializing the Cuban Missile Crisis. And basically it does a reading of the Cuban Missile Crisis in, 19, uh, in the 1960s, basically looking at the one piece of agency that we miss. We see it as a Khrushchev versus Kennedy, if you are more interested in leadership, or you look at it as the two superpowers fighting each other, if you're a realist, or democracy against non-democracy, um, and hegemony if you're a liberal. But post-colonial theory reveals something that everyone seems to miss. Castro asked for the missiles. Castro was desperate to find a permanent solution to making sure that America could not overthrow his new regime in Cuba. Postcolonial theory makes us pay attention to where we forget the agency of the postcolonial subject. And why did we forget the agency of the Cuban subject? We forgot because it got completely absorbed by our assumptions as to what a real power is, the USSR. Well, it turns out the little powers sometimes can also wag the tail of big powers. In my book on Vietnam, for instance, France, a country that was destroyed after World War II and did not have the same international influence as it had done the previous century, was able to persuade the United States to help it. And, and eventually, by the end of the French war in Vietnam, 1954, the United States was paying for about 80% of the French military effort in Indochina. And, as we all know, America was so persuaded that this was the front line in the struggle, global struggle against communism, that when the French left Indochina, the Americans continued that conflict. 
and there enter the bigger, more famous Vietnam War. Um, now, um, a couple of readings beyond uh, decolonializing the Cuban Missile Crisis would be my supervisor's book, The Postcolonial Subject. Um, and once you've read that, Homi Baba on culture and how assumptions about culture become a hierarchical set of ideas about which identities have agency, have power, have intelligence, have political culture and independence. Um, Edward Said, Orientalism, it's the key text. It's the beginning of all of our enthusiasm for postcolonialism. Orientalism is exceptional, however, is less political because um, Edward Said was a literary critic and he was looking at the politics of, for instance, American, British and French novels in the 20th century about the Middle East and why they create certain romantic but also deeply colonial ideas of the Orient. That's why the book is called Orientalism. Now finally, as we don't have much time left, um, I want to address the third, shall we say, field of questions. And Cassie asked it in a very poignant way. Uh, Cassie asked us in the question about questions, asked, um, can you expand on how realist appropriated authors like Thucydides and Machiavelli? Now, it's not a case of only appropriation. All philosophy is never truly new. It comes from a philosophical precedent. So, for instance, at the very least, my conceptual, I'm a theorist, but my conceptual predecessors ask questions that I'm interested in. At the very least, someone raised the question or answered a question wrong in the, to provoke for me to want to address it, right? So Foucault, for instance, did not revolutionize the world of political science and philosophy on his own. Foucault was actually picking a thread that had been left abandoned very much since the end of the 19th century um, that Nietzsche had left hanging. Nietzsche had asked, is the way we describe something for the end of that signifier in and of itself? Might it not be the case that language not only describes what we know, but also constitutes what we know? Nietzsche left these observations in a book called Untimely Meditations, basically a long book of quotes and excerpts from his notebooks, but he left that thread that Foucault felt the need to pick up once he broke with the structural school of his masters, people like Saussure and so on and so forth, the structured and understanding of Frankfurt School theory. Um, so this is just to tell you that all philosophical debates come from somewhere else. None comes from nowhere. Yeah? Um, even if you want to create a Genesis myth like Plato does with uh, Socrates, that was still a question that had been around and bouncing around philosophical circles for quite a long time, much as you want to create this Genesis myth. Now, Realists were in desperate need of a Genesis myth in the 1940s when realism became formalized as a set of theories because their opponents, whom they call utopianists, yeah, what we now know as the liberal tradition, had in fact existed for nearly 400 years. It began as a set of theories that we call rationalism and universal rationalism, and particularly one of my favorite philosophers of all time, John Locke, who in an essay called An Essay on Human Understanding, also known as Essay on Man, wrote, mankind isn't just born, it is also made. And this changed them. The understanding that the politics of me are perhaps as constructed as rather than from birth meant that liberalism could believe in good intentions. You see, could believe in changing norms. Now, of course, Locke leads us to Hume and the Scottish Enlightenment in the very early 1700s. Hume and Smith provoke the questions that lead to Kant. Kant opens Pandora's box. Kant and uh, La Rochefoucauld here in France in the 1600s open Pandora's box and we find ourselves debating the very nature of humanity by the time we get to the French Enlightenment. And the French Enlightenment did something exceptional philosophically, which was to change that assumption, pick up that Lockean assumption, Hume assumption, and then Kant assumption of mankind as this malleable, potentially good subject, and turn it into a project to change society, to intellectualize society, to make society not the best that it nature has made it to be. That's what Voltaire destroyed in his famous short story, Candide. But let's make it what we want it to be. That's why liberalism says we believe in these norms, 
like human rights, like democracy, let's make them happen. Now, liberalism has this distinguished 400-year-old history that if you want to trace it further back, it goes back into the history of Christianity, Thomas Aquinas, and even further back into post um, a, a pre ciceronian Aristotelian kind of global systems theory. Realism does not quite have this set of histories. And indeed, the, the earliest realists, people like uh, Morgenthau, did not claim that they came from Machiavelli and Thucydides. It was later the realists, particularly in the 50s and 60s, when these two became the first great debate of IR, that perhaps to add prestige to their tradition, but also to add more meat, more conceptual meat, I mean, and historical meat, they started to claim two authors in particular, Thucydides, a historian from Athens that wrote about the Peloponnesian War between Sparta and Athens, which was a war that, from the outside, looks quite similar to the Cold War, and um, Machiavelli, who wrote in the, in the Prince not only about the strategies of power and how to obtain and retain power, but about a similar global s systemic conflict that most realists do not seem to know about, and I make a point of humiliating them with this historical fact, which was the ideological struggle between Guelphs and Ghibellines that tore apart northern and republican Italy um, during the 1300s, 1400s and 1500s, and was very much the intellectual background of Machiavelli's writing. Now, I often criticize how some realists claim these two predecessors, because Machiavelli in particular was not unethical, which is the basic claim. Um, and the realist, reading, the realist reading of Machiavelli is mostly based on the prince, as opposed to his history of Florence and the Republic in particular. I en would encourage you to read The Republic, because in book two of The Republic, he does something exceptional, that realists thought was what made Machiavelli a realist. He basically dismantles the ethical foundations of Christianity. And this is very famous, and this is what ma made Machiavelli the evil writer, is why we use the word Machiavellian to say evil and manipulative and instrumental. But what people often forget is that in the subsequent two books, he writes in praise of Roman religion as something that could both drive the ethical nature of the state and its people, but also not take power away from the state. We forget that Machiavelli's key critique against the Catholic Church was that it sat above the states that Machiavelli was familiar with. We also forget that Machiavelli was a famous diplomat in his time. Machiavelli was Segretario di Stato della Repubblica. That means Secretary of State of the Republic of Florence. That was the title taken by the Americans, of course, which means that Machiavelli was, as it sounds, the foreign minister of the Republic of Florence. He was a very experienced diplomat. Um, and in fact, I've studied Machiavelli mostly as a diplomat, as, an, as a, one of the men responsible for setting up modern diplomacy. Um, and Machiavelli was thinking of power and international relations very much from the perspective of Florence, defending Florence. Of course, Machiavelli was annoyed about the power of the church because twice in, in Machiavelli's own lifetime, the church allied with outside powers to destroy the Florentine Republic and give it to a big noble. Yeah, the last one was, of course, the Medici clan who were made dukes of Tuscany. This is what Machiavelli was criticizing, outside universal power, not necessarily um, shall we say, ethics, and that's not to say that he was making a realist case. Um, another way in which Machiavelli is considered a realist is because Machiavelli is deeply anti-universalist. Machiavelli would have hated liberals for exactly that same reason. Having said that, let's not make cheap approximations. That does not, does not make Machiavelli a realist. Machiavelli was writing in the late 1400s, my friends. And so Machiavelli was very much a man of his time, a man of the state system of his time. And we're talking about tiny Italian Republican city states that in Machiavelli's time were being absorbed and taken over by the late Renaissance new system of feudal big lords supported by the massive powers of Spain and France in the Renaissance. Um, I think it's also important to understand the context in which Machiavelli was writing. I think that in 1492 Machiavelli was imprisoned and tortured after a coup d'etat provoked by a French invasion of northern Italy. Machiavelli spent a year and a half being tortured and in prison and then was exiled from Florence for the rest of his life. It's not terribly surprising that Machiavelli felt that it was important to understand the cruel systems through, power, through which power is obtained and maintained. This does not mean 
an observation of systems of power does not mean that you make systems of power a precept for the practice of power. This is very, very important. It also seems to me that another problematic approximation in making Machiavelli a realist is that Machiavelli saw power as a set of practices. You need to hold on to sympathy, so that's the symbolic power of a population, you need to hold on to institutions, you need to have the priests on your side, and so on and so forth. Machiavelli did not think that power was this ethereal, mysterious um, object that you put in your pocket, like realists seem to believe. Machiavelli very much saw power as a practice. Machiavelli saw himself as a diplomat, as someone that could enable Florence to punch above its weight. And Florence very much did punch above its weight in the 1400s. That's why the French was obsessed with controlling it. Um, and Machiavelli saw power as something that could be lost, something delicate, something that could be absorbed, taken, stolen. Not something that was imbued in the state and the institution. And finally, reading The Prince shows you another thing. The Machiavellian state is not this permanent entity that is either destroyed or exists, but rather is constantly riven by internal conflict, ideology. I mean, Machiavelli in his history of Florence even writes of something as late modern as populism. He writes about the two massive moments, populist moments that Florence had had. One in the 1300s, the takeover of the Duke of Athens, and another one in his own lifetime, in the 1490s, the um, kind of a massive populist movement actually led by a crazy priest called Savonarola that was remarkably very much like in our own time because it was deeply anti-elitist. I suggest that you look up Savonarola, Francesco de Savonarola and particularly his bonfire of the vanities. So I think I've tried to address the three main groups of questions that you've put to me guys. Um, I will try to do another video like this in two, three weeks from now at the end of term. So please send me more questions in um, the questions about questions thread in a housekeeping forum, guys. Um, let me say again, thank you so much for making this teaching and this term, teaching this module so enjoyable. You have made me not only a happy master's lecturer, but you've also made me a very happy online teacher, which I, I wasn't all that convinced that I would embrace quite like this. And most of all, congratulations to you. I know that many of you have busy lives, um, busy professional commitments. I know that many of you are even uh, finding it difficult to balance work with the big re reading particular requirements and writing requirements of this, of doing an online master's. I admire you guys for being able to do this part time and to be able to be so cogent and insightful in your participation in the forums and the essays I've marked so far. And I really have to say, I really look forward to the long essays at the end of the term, where you have the space to truly show your insights and develop more of yourselves. So, please write more questions for the next video in two, three weeks. Um, I'll be happy to address anything else. Uh, as you can see, I'm chatty as death. So, you're very welcome to say, Pablo, can you just chat, chat, chat about X, Y, Z? Anything that makes you curious, even things that are not necessarily in this module, like, to, like today's conversation on post-colonial theory. So finally, thank you so very much and uh, let me bid you good evening from uh, Café Mistral. Bye-bye.